Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me to speak about uh, my favorite topic, which is collectivity and relativistic nuclear collisions. And uh, what I'm uh, going to address today uh, is uh, the perfect fluid property of the quark gluon plasma, uh, which is a key discovery in our field. And uh, it's truly amazing because if you look at uh, many different uh, nearly perfect liquids um, at many different temperature scales, you find that uh, when you measure the fluid imperfection or shear viscosity over entropy density, you find that the quark gluon plasma is a true winner, uh, both in uh, being the hottest, but also in the most perfect fluid. So the question is, how is, uh, does this behavior emerge and what are its limits? And uh, today I'm going to give a very incomplete overview of how uh, our understanding uh, evolved over the years. We have uh, more than two decades uh, of data from RIC and uh, more than a decade now uh, from the LHC, uh, where these topics have, be, have been addressed uh, in very great detail. Uh, RIC uh, has uh, uh, the advantage that it's a dedicated heavy iron machine. And over the years, um, we have collided many, many different species and uh, with different energies. And uh, each time we collided a new species, we actually learned something new. And uh, I'm going to address some of these things today uh, very uh, superficially. Uh, here you see the uh, center of mass uh, energy and uh, the type of species that was collided. Uh, and uh, the delivered uh, uh, integrated luminosity. At the LHC, we have uh, less variety of species. However, the LHC strength is in its high luminosity, high energy uh, detectors that have very large acceptance and uh, uh, that allow for very precise measurements. So we're going to talk about collectivity. So I'm going to start with the simplest picture uh, discussing the elliptic flow. You have two nuclei coming at each other uh, here along the Z axis. Uh, they collide uh, and the overlap zone is uh, this ellipsoid shape. And uh, uh, in the transverse plane, you can define an impact parameter and the impact parameter in the Z axis defines a the reaction plane. Uh, if you uh, discuss the system in ideal hydrodynamics, you can define uh, the initial energy density and then let it evolve with uh, ideal hydrodynamics. Because of the initial uh, spatial anisotropy, what you will see is that the um, uh, pressure gradients uh, will push the liquid inside the, the reaction plane. And uh, in the end of the day, you can uh, define a reaction plane and you can measure the particles that come out of the collisions and they will not be distributed uh, anisotropically, but rather uh, they will preferentially be uh, emitted in the reaction plane. Then if you change the overlap zone of the two nuclei, uh, you will find that uh, this anisotropy is larger for a more anisotropic initial condition, which, is, which happens in more peripheral collisions. And it's uh, smaller in uh, the more central collisions. And you define the strength with the amplitude of uh, this distribution. Uh, and this is uh, the famous elliptic flow. This is literally uh, the day one measurement that uh, was um, done at Frick. Uh, this is the, uh, here on the left, you see the results from the first publication of the STAR collaboration, where the V2 strength was measured in uh, systems with uh, different uh, overlap zones measured here with the charged particle multiplicity. 
And these results were compared to ideal hydrodynamic calculations. And uh, it was found that uh, ideal hydrodynamics uh, really describes uh, uh, the data pretty well. Uh, and um, uh, in addition, uh, the flow of uh, identified particles was measured. And uh, what was found is that in order to describe the splitting in the uh, distributions for pions and uh, antiprotons, uh, you need to involve uh, a QGP uh, equation of state, although there are a lot of caveats uh, in these early calculations uh, that are now much better addressed. Um, so already from the first measurements, it looked like we are looking at something which is very close to ideal hydrodynamics. Uh, another way to look at the collective uh, behavior is to look uh, to measure the transverse momentum spectra for different particles. And this is what is shown here for uh, several different centralities, the measurements for the uh, spectra of pions, kaons, and antiprotons uh, measured by uh, both Phoenix and star. And the red lines are comparison to, again, to ideal hydrodynamics. And uh, uh, we see that the uh, spectral shapes change with the mass, and that is pretty well described by the hydrodynamics, uh, and that comes uh, from the fact that uh, in addition to this azimuthal anisotropy, the particles are uh, pushed uh, uh, in the radial direction with a common flow velocity, and the heavier particles appear at higher momentum. What came somewhat as a surprise is that the uh, pions and the protons at uh, relatively high momentum uh, come in uh, almost equal abundances, uh, which uh, is uh, hard to describe if uh, you think that hydrodynamics uh, doesn't hold at that high, high uh, momentum and uh, that particles are created by fragmentation of uh, uh, quarks or gluons. Um, what uh, uh, here we show the, the ratios of the proton to pion production for different centralities also compared to PHP collisions. And uh, uh, what we found is that indeed these ratios are pretty large at the intermediate transverse momentum. And a good explanation uh, later on uh, turned to be that uh, this can be understood uh, through a combination of uh, a radial flow effect for the heavier particles and uh, also production of baryons and mesons uh, through quark recombination, which uh, gives advantage of the baryons uh, at higher momentum. Another way to uh, look at uh, these uh, particle species dependence is to look at the flow, again, measured for many different types of particles. Ideal hydrodynamics uh, describes the distributions below 2 GV uh, remarkably well. Uh, at higher PT, uh, a feature appears which isn't in this ideal hydrodynamic description, and that is that the baryons, uh, the lambdas and the protons have higher V2 than the mesons here, uh, K-short pions. Uh, and within the recombination picture, uh, this behavior can be understood in terms of um, uh, generating the hadrons through a recombination of quarks and uh, since the, it's the quarks that appear to flow, um, if you uh, divide the flow by the number of quarks and the momentum by the number of quarks, and then also describe it uh, as a kinetic energy instead of momentum to take uh, care of the mass dependencies, uh, you find a universal description. So all these things, uh, along with other measurements that uh, indicate that the system is a very dense uh, system, which cannot be hadronic, uh, led to the um, RIC uh, discovery of uh, a nearly perfect fluid. So at the time, uh, of course, we tried to compare to every hydrodynamic calculation that uh, was on the market, 
And uh, for these two observables, the flow here is scaled by the eccentricity and the transverse momentum spectra. What we found uh, here in the Phoenix White paper is that uh, not all hydro models describe all observable with the same set of parameters. And uh, the best description uh, you find uh, with the models that uh, are modeling the decoupling stage uh, microscopically. Um, and with that, uh, uh, the first uh, multi-component modeling of the heavy ion collision emerged. Um, and uh, you will hear during this school uh, about how the modern implementation of uh, this multi-stage modeling work uh, in Jetscape. Um, but uh, basically, you start with the initial state uh, where you define the initial energy density profile and the event by event fluctuations. There are different uh, types of models that can give you information about the initial state. Then we have some pre-equilibrium dynamics and then quark gluon plasma is formed that uh, may be thermally equilibrated or well, maybe not. Uh, and uh, uh, it, then you uh, solve the hydrodynamic equations uh, preferably <laughs> viscous hydrodynamic equations. You need to, to define also an equation of state in order to solve uh, the, all the, to close the system of equations and uh, also uh, some transport coefficients. Uh, we also need a decoupling scheme, how to move from a fluid to um, a hadron gas. And then uh, you can handle the interactions in the hadron gas with a microscopic model um, that describes uh, hadronic interactions. Uh, and uh, during the hadronic stage, uh, the particles can still change their uh, momentum uh, distributions until they decouple and stream out to our detectors. And uh, the important part here is that the modeling of all stages is important also how you switch from one to another. And uh, this uh, contributes to the uncertainties in um, determining various uh, uh, observables uh, and uh, properties of the quark gluon plasma. On the experimental side, uh, there are also uh, things that we need to define, um, uh, namely, uh, uh, the first thing you, you need to define is uh, uh, things like the centrality, you need to define the nuclear geometry. Uh, we don't have control over how exactly the nuclei will collide. Uh, so we have to rely on modeling to infer from what we see in the final state uh, of the particles that are produced uh, of how exactly the nuclei collided. And uh, if you can imagine two nuclei coming uh, at each other, there are many uh, different ways in which you can collect uh, uh, these nuclei on the periphery. And that's why the probability distribution looks, has this general shape. Uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, ways to collect uh, uh, peripherally and uh, very few ways to collect uh, exactly head on. So these are the most central collisions. Uh, the nucleons that uh, fall into the overlap zone uh, called uh, uh, participants and uh, the, the others that fly down the beam pipe are called spectators. And uh, looking at such distributions, um, uh, they are proportional to um, uh, the uh, multiplicity in the collisions and we can use the final state multiplicity, for example, or transverse energy to define the centrality of the collision. Um, here, uh, I, I give you an example of how this is defined uh, in the CMS experiment based on the transverse energy. Uh, you slice the uh, distribution into percentiles of the total uh, inelastic cross section. And these are the numbers uh, that we see as a percentile centralities. Now to define how many nucleons participated and how many times they collided, uh, the standard uh, description is in terms of a Glauber model. 
where you have a wood saxon nuclear distribution, you put in the Lawrence boost, uh, also information about the inelastic uh, nucleon nucleon cross section, and uh, then uh, you, you follow the, the nucleons on a straight line trajectories, you throw the dice, and you find out whether a nucleon participated or it didn't. And then there are a variety of ways to make correspondence with uh, experimental observables. These two uh, uh, quantities, the number of participants and number of collisions are important because uh, in terms of understanding of our uh, physics, uh, uh, the, the number of participants is more relevant quantity for soft physics and the number of collisions is for hard scattering physics. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, every time we collided a new species, we learned something new. So uh, here's the, an example uh, when we uh, collided uh, copper copper and uh, then compared to gold gold, uh, we measured elliptic flow in both systems. We compared the two systems for the same number of participants. We expected that we will see a difference because in the smaller nucleus for the same number of participants, you have a more spherical shape. Yes, indeed, uh, the flow measured in copper copper was lower uh, than uh, that in gold gold. But then you, we expected that if you divide by the eccentricity, um, which is driving this uh, azimuthal isotropy, you will find that uh, the two systems uh, uh, collapse to the same behavior. And this, in fact, uh, wasn't the case until we take into account that uh, the nucleons that interacted, uh, the participants, uh, are not uh, exactly in the, this overlap uh, zone of the two uh, nuclei being considered as smooth objects. But in fact, on an event-by-event -event basis, there will be uh, fluctuations in uh, the orientation of uh, uh, the nucleon uh, or the participant plane that you can define. So there's an angle which is different from the, the reaction plane. And once you define the eccentricity uh, in a coordinate system that uh, minimizes the uh, covariance between the X and Y distribution here of the participants, then you find the participant eccentricity and uh, uh, then uh, comparison between gold, gold and copper, copper divided by this participant eccentricity uh, indeed show the same uh, behavior. So this, these fluctuations uh, are also uh, very important to understand in terms of how exactly you measure your flow um, there are different methods of uh, measuring flow. Um, for example, some methods uh, try to define the reaction plane or event plane based on the final state particles. Others use two particle or multi-particle correlation. All these methods are affected differently uh, by the um, fluctuations and uh, they will give you a different answer and you need to understand the fluctuations on the side of the theory, uh, the key question is to actually determine how perfect is the fluid. And uh, Julia, yes. before you move on, can you go back to the previous slide? There was a question about the brackets. I think this is an average, but um, okay, yeah. So yep. what about are the angular angular brackets around here? Uh, what are the angular brackets? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. this is an average over uh, many events. So. On each event, uh, you will have some distribution, then you average over many events, and uh, uh, that's how you determine the, 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 the average uh, eccentricity. Good, thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, again, so at the time we uh, realized that we are dealing with a nearly perfect fluid, we didn't yet have uh, actually uh, uh, working numeric uh, uh, relativistic viscous hydrodynamics. So um, we had estimates of what the viscous corrections will do to, to the observables, but we didn't have it solved. So it came later and uh, in 20, 
2007 and uh, at that time uh, we started really making precise comparisons between theory and uh, experiment and uh, we really made progress. Another step in our understanding uh, was uh, came in 2010 when we realized that uh, due to these uh, event by event fluctuations in the initial state, uh, even if you collide symmetric species, uh, you can still have um, uh, different uh, high order harmonics that will give you uh, a lot of information about the system. So the first comparisons to uh, measurements uh, uh, using viscous hydrodynamics uh, uh, showed uh, pretty good agreement with the data given uh, that these were the first comparisons, but the depending on the initial state configuration, whether this came from a color glass condensate description or from a global model, um, the values that you found for at OS were a factor of two, two different. Um, so there were also uh, experimental uncertainties uh, in mainly in understanding again the role of uh, the fluctuations and how different methods are affected by the fluctuations and also uh, non flow correlations. Again, yeah, a true breakthrough happened when we understood that nuclei are not spheres but rather made by nucleons, and uh, you can have not just uh, elliptic flow, but rather a whole slew of uh, harmonics. Uh, you can have triangular uh, shapes and uh, also uh, other shapes, higher order harmonics. And uh, this uh, realization also gave an answer to uh, somewhat puzzling uh, and not well understood uh, behavior in uh, the particle distributions uh, called the rich. Uh, basically, if you look at the uh, two dimensional correlations between the azimuthal angle between two particles and their uh, pseudo rapidity uh, separation, you would find a, a, a peak on the near side, which uh, comes with uh, short range jet correlations. But then you have this extended structure and uh, with the understanding of um, these fluctuations event by event at the earliest time, uh, uh, it, it was realized that this ridge in fact is uh, uh, based on uh, the hydrodynamic, uh, uh, the, how these uh, fluctuations at the earliest time propagate hydrodynamically through the system. So you could take a slice uh, in the delta at the distribution uh, where the uh, uh, where the particles are separated away from the jet peak and then uh, look at the delta phi distribution and uh, fit it with a Fourier uh, series. And uh, what you find is that you don't only have second harmonic, uh, uh, but you also have a pretty strong third harmonic and uh, other harmonics as well. Um, it was around 20... 10, 2011, where all experiments basically measured the a full harmonic spectrum. And here I showed the measurements from Atlas. And uh, what you see is that the, the second harmonic, the elliptic flow, so this is the more central collisions, more spherical and the, uh, more peripheral, which are more ellipsoid in the beginning. Uh, the elliptic flow is uh, very much affected by the geometry but the triangular flow, which is driven by these fluctuations and shown in the red points, is pretty much independent of uh, the centrality. And then there are other harmonics. And uh, in order to describe these kind of fluctuations in the hydrodynamics, uh, what you need to do now is to uh, actually uh, instead of uh, creating a lot of initial de energy density profiles, averaging them and then running the hydrodynamics, you have to run the hydrodynamics uh, 
uh, on an event by event basis in order to, to see how these fluctuations will affect the final observables. And uh, here's an example uh, from this uh, paper of some hydro profiles, how they evolve uh, with viscosity and how the initial uh, lumpy distribution uh, gets propagated if the uh, distribution, if the hydro is ideal or if you have viscosity. So basically uh, now with measuring the, all these harmonics, you could probe the system at different length scales and uh, uh, really uh, get much more detailed information about the transport parameters. And with that, um, a very detailed comparison was made to all harmonics, uh, the, up to five here, both uh, measured the trick and the DLHC. And again, we found that the uh, uh, shear viscosity over the entropy density is, is a, a very small um, uh, compared to uh, the minimal uh, value that uh, came from some string theory uh, considerations. Um, over the years, uh, we have uh, developed a lot more uh, very detailed observables. Here's a slide that I took from Jenny Angier's uh, uh, student day lecture at Cork Map 18. Uh, and uh, uh, you see here uh, that uh, not only the, um, the flow, uh, the different harmonics were measured, but the event by event distributions, they were compared to the theory both for the initial eccentricity and how it translates into flow, uh, the correlations between different uh, event uh, plane angles were measured and also things like uh, called symmetric cumulus, the correlations and anti-correlations between odd and even harmonics. So many, many detailed measurements and uh, Zhang's uh, conclusion here is that uh, the, all of these are sensitive to the details of the transport coefficients and the uh, uh, temperature dependence. And uh, basically we have so many measurements that this, the problem is over constrained. Um, now, more recently, uh, we have started uh, some detailed uh, comparisons between the theory and the data uh, based on uh, Bayesian uh, inference. Uh, and uh, so here I show an example from, from this paper from 2016, where uh, the authors used data from identified particle yields shown here and the mean PT and several flow harmonics. Um, to extract, uh, to train the models uh, and uh, extract uh, posterior distributions, which agree very well with the data, with that to uh, set bounds to uh, the uh, temperature dependence of eta over S. Um, let me see. So there are there questions in the chat? Uh, there was one, but I thought maybe we'd do this at the end, so you can okay. just continue. All right, so uh, let me, how I get rid of this? Um, in Jetscape, uh, we recently, well, Jetscape recently did uh, some uh, detailed uh, based on parameter estimation. And uh, there, there are two papers last year uh, one in Fisgraph Letters and uh, another, another one uh, in Fisgraph C, very detailed paper. Uh, and uh, both the temperature dependence of the shear viscosity of entropy density here at over S and the bulk viscosity were estimated. Uh, you see here the the prior distribution and the posterior in uh, yellow. Uh, notably, it looks like uh, these are not, not so tight as the ones that we see on the previous uh, slide. Uh, but uh, this was uh, attributed to the fact that 
here uh, and I quote from the paper, we improve on earlier such studies by accounting for known theoretical ambiguities in our quantification of the uncertainties of the inferred viscosities. Uh, so, so basically there were uh, theoretical uncertainties that uh, were treated more carefully and that's uh, why the uh, distributions uh, seem to be less uh, constrained here. On the experimental side, uh, experimentalists continue to look for more observables and more detailed uh, comparisons with the theory. Here I just show an example of some of the things that were um, shown uh, for the first time uh, at uh, Cork Matter uh, in Krakow this year. For example, the Alice collaboration measured the flow um, in several different methods. Uh, this is a two particle correlation method with, uh, uh, again, with some separation of the particles uh, in pseudo rapidity, and then four particle correlations, but they also measured uh, the flow with respect to uh, a plane which is defined by the spectators measured their forward detectors and uh, uh, the expectations with this measurement is that you uh, learn uh, more about uh, the nature of the flow fluctuations and uh, what the, the distributions look like. Uh, sorry. Um, similarly, um, CMS uh, in lead lead collisions measured uh, elliptic flow not just with two particles but with four six eight and now even ten particle cumulants of a very broad range of uh, centrality and uh, one can look at the tiny so, so you can look at also the systematic uncertainties are very small so you can make sense of actually some tiny differences between these um, measurements uh, with different number of particles. And then uh, looking at that, you can extract information about the hydrodynamic distributions of the fluctuations, uh, skewness, uh, and other, other parameters that uh, uh, really uh, detailed comparisons. Similarly, the star collaboration uh, measured uh, the flow V2 and V3 as a function of centrality in two different uh, collision systems that are isobars. Uh, that means that they have the same number of nucleons, uh, but they have the same the different uh, number of protons and neutrons respectively. So. Both of these are 96, ruthenium, ruthenium, and zirconium, zirconium. The goal of this measurement was actually to study chiral magnetic effect, basically to change the uh, electric charge without changing the number of nucleons. The idea was that the, for the flow, supposedly the, uh, the two systems will be the same, but for chiral magnetic effect, they will be different. So. We were looking, uh, there was a blind analysis performed to, to examine the, if there's a magnetic field and chiral magnetic effect. However, uh, what uh, uh, people found is that uh, they still had some um, differences in the flow. So here you look at the ratio uh, of the measured flow, supposedly for the same centrality uh, the ratio of the uh, V2 uh, measured in the two systems and the V3 measured in the two systems. And the, in the numerator, you have the ruthenium, which uh, has a prolate shape. And in the denominator, you have the zirconium, which looks more like a pair. And uh, uh, if you look at this in the most central collisions, what you're probing is actually uh, ruthenium has more, uh, 
more elliptic shape. Oops, sorry. And um, uh, therefore, uh, the interpretation of uh, this ratio is that uh, because of that, you measure higher flow, elliptic flow in the ruthenium. And uh, in zirconium, on the other hand, it looks more triangular, so you, you measure higher uh, uh, triangular flow in the zirconium. So this is just an example of what kind of things people are thinking of, how to utilize uh, these uh, very detailed measurements beyond uh, determining the properties of the core gluon plasma, but rather in this case, it's uh, determining uh, nuclear deformation. So I can summarize now that uh, uh, what we see uh, from large systems we have a, a wealth of high precision measurements and uh, these establish the near perfect fluidity of the core gluon plasma. We have made over the years very significant progress in theoretical modeling. And uh, we have modern theory to data comparisons that uh, account for experimental and model uncertainties and uh, now give some meaningful constraints on the QGP transport coefficients. Uh, on the other hand, there are many new experimental observables that are yet to be included in this global analysis, and we hope that these kind of uh, estimates will improve, will improve in the future. Uh, we also have upcoming uh, runs. Uh, uh, LHC just uh, starting up now uh, for the run three, and uh, there will be a heavy iron run uh, in November. And uh, we will have uh, during Grand three, which will last several years, we will collect a lot more data and uh, we will be able to study uh, this kind of collective effects with, uh, in detail with, with rare probes. We already have a lot of measurements that I did not show, uh, but uh, we can really make detailed measurements now with heavy flavor and quarconia and uh, um, uh, jets and things like that. A trick, on the other hand, uh, we just completed a beam energy scan and a lot of the data is being analyzed uh, that goes down to low energy. We're trying to study the critical, if there's a critical point in the phase diagram and where this core gluon plasma turns off uh, and we have a hadronic system. We also have a new state-of-the-art detector called S-Phoenix, which uh, will start uh, first taking data in 2023. And uh, the STAR experiment, on the other hand, has a forward uh, upgrade uh, that uh, provides very uh, large coverage and uh, uh, precision for flow measurements. And I, I, I can take questions if there are any for, for this part of my talk, and then I briefly go to uh, small systems. Yeah, maybe while people are thinking, if they have a question, we can go back to the one that was asked in the chat. Um, Shubham, do you want to ask it yourself, or should I read it? Okay, maybe I just read it then. Um, so the question was, depending upon how the particles are ejected after the collisions, how can we have an idea about the shape of the nuclei and, and impact parameter at the same time? The shape of the nuclei and I think this the... is related to the nuclear structure you were just mentioning yeah, with yeah. the But I mean, the, the question was asked way earlier than, than you uh, showed so the slide. So it was before but... <laughs> I was, uh, uh, yeah. So the, uh, the impact parameter, we just relate uh, through the measurements of, as I mentioned, uh, multiplicity and uh, uh, transverse energy, some global uh, event characterization. We, we don't have direct access to the impact parameter, but the, uh, the correspondence uh, between the impact parameter and uh, this uh, multiplicity observables is pretty straightforward and uh, uh, in large system, it becomes a problem in, in small systems uh, because these uh, correlations uh, 
it, a, a broad and uh, it very much depends on where uh, in which uh, space uh, uh, which kinematic space you measure the multiplicity you can have uh, various autocorrelations so it's a much more difficult questions in small systems but uh, about the shape uh, this is uh, an example of how you may learn something about the shape basically uh, it's through the model of comparison you would put in your model calculation the deformation of the nucleus and then you see what kind of deformation will describe the data for the flow observables that you measure. Did this answer that does, Yeah, if it doesn't, then you'll have to speak up again or... Good, now we have one more. Yeah, yeah, okay. So this was okay. good for the person. So then uh, we have another question in the chat. Victor, do you want to ask yourself on mute or should I? Maybe I just do it. How the idea of a QGP thermally equilibrated or not can affect the hydrodynamics of the system? Should we expect big changes from that difference? Uh, I think yes, because the whether you have a equilibrium or not, this may affect the, the equation of state. Um, yeah, I think maybe first of all, hydrodynamics can only be applied if you are close to equilibrium. But um, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Yeah, that, that's the, the, the understanding is that, that you need to have a local thermal equilibrium, at least locally, to apply the hydrodynamic description. And that's one of the big questions for the small systems. So how can, why does hydrodynamics work in small systems? Maybe I move on to the small systems? Yeah, maybe this is a good <laughs> connection to the second parties. Yeah, so the longstanding paradigm in our field was that uh, the small systems, you can't, thermally equilibrate because there are not enough particles and the system is very short-lived to achieve equilibration. And therefore, uh, in the small system, you can just uh, use them as a reference for cold nuclear matter effects, but uh, you don't really form quark one plasma. And uh, that uh, indeed, so if you look at the, the rich uh, observable, here in PP collisions, minimum bias, uh, indeed compared to lead-lead collisions, you see this ridge that we associate with uh, collective flow. In minimum bias PP, we don't see it. However, um, occasionally you can get uh, PP collisions that produce a lot of particles. And uh, this is an event display of uh, one such collision. Uh, of course, I wouldn't say this is the uh, average collision. Of course, we pick the, the one that produced the most particles, uh, but uh, these kind of collisions do happen. And uh, then if you look into these collisions, uh, if, where you have reconstructed more than 110 particles between one and three GeV at mid rapidity, uh, you actually see uh, a, a hint of, a, of this kind of rich behavior. So the question is, it looks similar, but is it the same as uh, the same origin as uh, what we see in a large system? So it was a subtle effect in PP collisions, but once we started looking at proton lead collisions, and here is the rich that we saw there, uh, there was no longer subtle effect, so it was very comparable to, to what you see in lead-lead collisions. So P-lead, very similar to lead-lead. Uh, of course, then you go ahead and measure uh, the flow uh, components. We measured V2, we measured V3, uh, both with two particles, with four particles, compared to hydrodynamic predictions. and. Uh, Lo and behold, uh, uh, the data was very well described. 
uh, by the hydrodynamic description. And that uh, there is a puzzle. So you want to ask, okay, if you think that the system doesn't equilibrate, are these just uh, some uh, co correlations that are among few particles or is really the system truly collective? And um, to answer that, you want to measure multi-particle correlations. And uh, here we show the uh, leadlet uh, measurements and the pilet measurements for two particle correlations and four particle <coughs> cumulants. And you see that uh, uh, indeed four particles also uh, show uh, uh, large V2. Um, then we measure V2 with six particles and uh, uh, this uh, sort of agrees uh, with the measurement with four particles. We add eight particles, same story, uh, or we, within 10%, uh, uh, we, we also add Lear and zeros. Everything uh, seems to agree that uh, this looks like a collective effect. Other observables that were associated in large systems with the formation of a pork gluon plasma. Um, uh, this uh, uh, the production of uh, strangeness, for example, and equilibration of uh, different uh, hadronic uh, species. Uh, as you go from uh, low multiplicities to large multiplicities, uh, for example, in strangeness production, um, you see that uh, this, you have a strangeness enhancement uh, compared to PP collisions in the large systems, but there's nothing uh, really uh, uh, like a step uh, or there's no uh, significant difference rather the, the, the change in the uh, particle uh, production changes very gradually with multiplicity. We also measured uh, uh, this is a measurement from a list, the uh, production and the flow of uh, hadrons of, with different masks. And again, you see this uh, mass dependence, which in large systems is associated with the collective flow and the fact that the particles move with common flow velocity. And uh, Moreover, if you take a hydrodynamic model that describes um, lead lead collisions uh, with uh, great precision, several different harmonics, don't change the parameters, just apply it to uh, P lead and to even to PP collisions, you find that uh, actually hydrodynamics gives pretty good description of the system unreasonably so because uh, you're looking here at very small systems, very short-lived too. So the question is, uh, of course, uh, why, why is that? And can we test this further? Or do we need a paradigm shift that namely that you can produce for gluon plasma and for gluon plasma is the source of this kind of collective behaviors also in small systems. So uh, given the measurements at the LHC, uh, the RIC experiments uh, proposed and uh, took advantage of the unique versatility of RIC to collide different species. So um, three different uh, collision systems uh, were uh, studied proton on gold, deuteron on gold, helium three on gold. The idea here is that uh, if you model the eccentricities uh, in these systems um, and you model the hydrodynamic uh, evolution in a proton gold collision, you have a system which is mostly spherical. In a deuteron gold collision, you start with a system that is mostly elliptic and in helium, Three gold, you have three nucleons, so you have uh, both a triangular and elliptic uh, shape. So if you look at the eccentricities from the global model, which are shown here, you expect that if you measure the elliptic flow, uh, 
you will see a small elliptic flow for p gold and larger for d gold and helium three gold. And on the other hand, if you look at the uh, third harmonic, because helium three has three nucleons and intrinsic triangle shape, that you would see somewhat larger uh, third harmonic uh, in helium three gold compared to p gold and d gold. And this is indeed uh, what was seen in the measurement. So this, these are the V2 measurements, again, corresponding in hierarchy to the predictions uh, based on the initial geometry. And uh, uh, the, the V3 measurements show the, the largest uh, signal in helium 3 gold and smallest signals in P gold and D gold. Uh, comparing these results to two hydrodynamic calculations give a pretty good description of the system. Again, these are same code parameters uh, as uh, in gold-gold collisions. So it looks like you can describe small systems with very similar, um, uh, very similar parameters for the core gluon plasma being formed. Uh, at RIC, uh, we also measured uh, uh, multiparticle correlations, again, with the idea that uh, if you're looking at a system which is uh, truly collective, you would find uh, that not only two particle correlations or correlations with respect to some kind of event plane, but uh, also multiparticle correlations. And uh, these are the measurements in D-gold collisions as a function of uh, multiplicity, in particular region in the detector. And uh, similar to the LHC measurement, you see that the four and six particle cumulants uh, agree. We also measured uh, uh, identified particles, uh, and this is V2 measurement. In, P gold, D gold, helium three gold for pions and protons. And you see the characteristic mass splitting at uh, low PT and the baryons going above the mesons for uh, higher PT above two GV. That's in the data. The hydro, uh, this particular hydro doesn't have uh, hybridization by recombination. So it doesn't capture this feature of the data, but it does describe very nicely the, the split at low PT. Uh, we looked at the quark number scaling uh, and uh, for the three systems, and uh, it looks like it uh, approximately holds also in these small systems, uh, much better in helium-3 than in proton gold, but uh, overall not, not bad. Um, an alternative. So are you gonna so like three more minutes or so? So we have some time for questions. Possibly? Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm finishing up. So an alternative uh, explanation for for this kind of uh, small system correlations was uh, proposed uh, by color glass condensate from initial uh, momentum correlations. Uh, however, uh, these uh, uh, models, although they produce uh, some uh, Correlations, they uh, could not uh, uh, really uh, reproduce the hierarchy that is seen in the measurements uh, that were in the data. Um, and there are other measurements that I will not uh, touch upon, uh, they're still uh, under investigations. Uh, but uh, I, I'd like to summarize here uh, and we have uh, this perfect fluid QGP behavior, which we find is ubiquitous. It shows up both in large and in small systems, even short-lived systems that appear to be far from equilibrium, appear to behave hydrodynamically. We still try to understand the origin uh, of these uh, behaviors. We have a wealth of precise data that still needs to be included in model comparison, but 
we're definitely making progress uh, in detailed accounts of uh, model uncertainties and quantifying the QGP transport coefficients, both shear and power viscosity. And uh, just to advertise the uh, Jetscape activities, uh, uh, the collaboration is working on new unified description for both small and large systems and low energy systems, and uh, including uh, in the future electron amp collisions. Thank you. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much, Julia, for this nice, nice overview. Um, so we had one question that was basically before you started talking about small systems, which was basically are the collective like effects more like QGP or some other state? I would say you have answered this with your yes. <laughs> part. If not, please, uh, Pablo, say it again, What if you still have a question on this. Otherwise, of course, other questions are very welcome now. something could briefly explain cold, cold nuclear, nuclear matter, matter effects effect. yeah okay all right so what are called nuclear matter effects so when you look at uh, a system which doesn't make a core gluon plasma but you have a nucleus it's not a proton proton collision you have a nucleus uh, the nucleons inside this nucleus are in a bound state. So, so they interact. Um, the nuclear wave function is different from that of a proton. And you may have different, for example, different parton distributions in a nucleus. You can have other effects like uh, when the proton comes in and has to plow through this nucleus, it will experience multiple soft scatterings uh, and um, the eventually the particle distributions uh, may be broadened with respect to uh, distributions that you will get uh, in proton-proton collisions uh, just because the, the distributions were smeared with these uh, momentum exchanges. Um, then uh, you have other effects, depends on what you're looking at. Uh, if, you, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, production of quarconia, um, still the quarconia may be broken up uh, even in cold nuclear matter uh, because of interactions with uh, the nucleus. So there are various such effects uh, that need to be understood and taken into account. So, so that's why measurements um, in proton-proton collisions typically serve as a reference baseline, but uh, proton nucleus collisions are also uh, considered to be a very uh, important baseline for these cold nuclear matter effects. Okay, so then we have two more questions now in the chat. I mean, one actually came from, from Slack. Um, that is um, the question if uh, from pra, pra, Buda, pra, Bu, Pada, um, if hydrodynamics is also applicable at low energy collisions like the 7.7 .7 GV from STAR. So does hydrodynamics also work there? Um, I, I think so. There, there were, I, I didn't include uh, there are measurements that have been compared. And I think uh, at this energy, we still see hydrodynamics. Um, I, don't, I need to look it up <laughs> to be certain. Uh, we, there are measurements that uh, for some observables already uh, see that uh, there's a different behavior when you go to the lower energy and that the system looks uh, more uh, hadronic. Um, but I, I'm not sure about the energy, so I have to look it up. Mm -hmm. The star measured lower than 7.7 7, uh, because the measurements that uh, were done uh, with also fixed target configuration that goes below that. 
um, so yeah, maybe the, I can do a quick comment on that question yeah, please <laughs> um so so I, my, my rough assessment would be that this around this energy as Julia pointed out you will have a significant part of the system that is in, not in equilibrium so you really have to merge non-equilibrium evolution with equilibrium description so I, short answer would be yes I think hydrodynamics is still applicable but just not in the whole system so you have to somehow make sure that your model uh, has both components um, but more details have to be certainly figured out in the in the future um, and then we have one more last question to, to Julia I think here um, from Joseph, which is in small systems, PP or PA, modern bulk viscosity parametrizations tend to cause large space-time regions to be in zero pressure due to bulk pressure cancels, uh, cancels out with equilibrium pressure. So the codes cannot go to negative pressure to be stable as far as he knows. Um, do you check those so-called cavitation instabilities when you introduce bulk viscosity to small systems? So I'm not sure if you are the right person to answer this. Or I this will not be able to answer that. I would by one of the hydropolitanists, so maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe you should know something. But it's more. an interesting uh, question. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. In fact, in the hydro codes that were compared to data, whether the bulk viscosity is considered or not. I'm not sure about yeah, that. Yeah, bulk viscosity is considered if I can chime yes, in. And uh, I mean, there, there, it can happen that you get the negative pressures. I usually, I don't think cavitation really happens. So um, I, I don't think you see these instabilities that people were concerned about. Um, I think in some codes you make sure that the uh, viscous corrections never, or most codes you make sure the viscous corrections don't get bigger than the ideal part, and that's usually handled more or less with some algorithm that's put in by hand to reduce the viscous corrections. Usually that happens only outside the freeze out surface, so where you have really low ideal parts, uh, and so that doesn't really affect your final results for your observables because it happens outside where you, you know, get any information in the end. Um, um, but uh, I mean, yeah, so usually one deals with that by kind of fixing it by hand if it happens, but usually it happens only where you don't really care except for, for stability reasons. But that happens with the shear viscosity as well. I hope that helps. Maybe someone yeah. else wants to Thank add. you, Vera. Yeah, I think that that's, that's might helpful. Have been a good, good answer for now. And with that, I think we should uh, thank Julia for her nice uh, overview lecture and uh, move on to the next one. So thank you.